Hi, I'm Paul Brody. We're in my shop here. Man named Mitch behind the cameras. Thank you, Mitch. What are we doing today? Well, we're back in the shop and we're gonna work on a fender. This is the CR750 fender and I think they took the bike apart somewhat, sent it out for a nice coat of paint. Looks good. And the fender mount got lost. So that became my job because you need to mount a fender and where do you buy a CR750 race bike fender 50 years later? I do not know. So we've just finished Christmas. Santa appears to be very good to me. So let me show you what I got here. Look at that gauge. That's beautiful. It's liquid filled. That's going to go on my hydraulic press. Thank you, Dean. Appreciate that very much. We still have to put a flange on the outside marking all the tons after it gets calibrated but that will be an upcoming video where we upgrade my hydraulic press that I've had for a very long time. Needs it. I also finally found after seven years I got these. These are tool holders for my lathe. I got these at the price I wanted basically half price and I got them locally and now I have nine of these. A machinist always needs a lot of tool holders for their lathe. And in the spirit of Christmas, I bought myself, can you see back here? This is an ultrasonic parts cleaner and I've wanted one for quite some time and the price was reasonable. This is, this is where the parts go. In here, there's a little tray and this is like a little, well, you use these to hold tea leaves when you're making tea. That's one use. And then it, it holds the little screws and that stops them falling down. So I need to put in a, a pipe here. They gave a plastic fitting that didn't fit. So I'll put a brass fitting in there. So looking forward to that. So next thing we're going to do is to, uh, is to walk around the bike and I'll show you things that I have observed on the bike because it's a 50 year old race bike and it's been kind of put together and there's no safety wiring anywhere, which on a race bike, road race bike, you have safety wiring everywhere. So that's one of the things I noticed. So we're gonna do a little walk around. This is one of the early, early sand cars cases. Honda made sand cars cases in the early part of 69 up until the summer. And then they decided, okay, this project's really gonna go. We need to do the die cast cases. So. Nobody really seems to know how many sand cast cases were made, maybe a couple hundred. I'm kind of, of guessing here, making an uh, assumption. But I think, I think that 200 is probably a safe number. So we're going to go with that. If you have one of these, they are highly sought after. They would be very valuable to find. And you're going to pay a lot of money if you find one. So I would say that this bike is, you could call it a 1970 because that's about when they started working on it. On a CB750, it's got the serial number up on the head tube. This has nothing on the head tube. It's all very smooth. I can't see any grinding marks, can't see any file marks. On the down tubes, when I look through here, there's all sorts of, can you see here? on the down tubes, there is all sorts of welding going on here. So I don't, I do not know what has happened here. It's safe to say that maybe the frame got hit. Maybe it was a used frame, got modified. I do not know. So that's, that's the serial numbers that have, have been, have been looked at now. Now on the rims, I want to show you this. Can you see here, there's an angle. When they drill the hole in the rim, there's a certain angle for the spoke. Can you see here how it's not the same angle? There's a, there's a kink right there. So that's one of the things I don't like. So I don't know about this rim. This, this is an unshouldered rim. It has no shoulder to it. Whereas if you look up at the front, can you see there's a shoulder here? So each of these rims is alloy and the, and, and the spokes are, are drilled at a, the spoke holes in the rim are drilled at a, at, a, at a much better angle. There's no kink. So this is kind of a mismatched pair of rims. I assume that this was the stock rim 
that came with the bike, or the kit. We're gonna talk about that later. And maybe this got added on later to put on a larger tire. That's my assumption. You see the hole here? There's a hole here, and there's a hole up here. What that's for, back in the 70s, that was the rim lock. You took a sheet metal screw, you figured out exactly how long you could have the screw because the screw would go into the bead of the tire, but not into the inner tube. So that would get screwed in. And you have on this wheel, you have this rim, you have one, two, and then probably on the other side, you have three, four. And, and the front rim also has, it looks like it's got four on each side. So that's what they did in the 70s. And I think in the 80s, that was discontinued. So that was something out of the 70s for sure. It was pointed out to me a couple days ago that on the, on the carburetors, and these, these kind of look like they're sand cars. These are, are Keyhein carbs. I'm not sure how you pronounce that exactly. But do you see this here? It's got a plunger for the float ball like, like on an Amel carburetor, like an Amel monoblock or an Amel concentric. You don't, you don't see this on these, on, the, on these Japanese carbs. What they usually have is a linkage. You pull the choke lever, all four chokes go up at the same time. But on this, this set of carbs, each carb has its individual plunger. Yeah, right there. It's hiding on me. So that's, that's very interesting on these carburetors. Just wanted to point that out to you. I put the seat on. It, it came to me after it got painted and I was looking to see how it mounted and uh, not really happy with the mounting, how it is at all. What they've done is, is to drill holes right into the frame rail. And on each side, there's a, a six mil Allen screw that goes in. So it's, see that it's kind of hinged right there. And then someone has notched out for where the shock goes, but this is obviously way too high. And I've been, I've been really, really careful with the seat, but it's already got a crack right here. So that's a weak point. Underneath here, I can't take it off right now, but, but the frame rails end right. Can you see where the frame rails end? What should really happen is the tube should go to the back and support it at the back. Because usually when you want to start one of these bikes, if you don't have a set of rollers, someone's going to push you and they're going to push you on the seat and this is gonna break. So this, unless this bike just sits in a showroom and doesn't get moved around very much at all, this is definitely a weak point. So just mention that. We're gonna look around at the brake now because the brakes are quite interesting on this bike. When you bought the kit, Honda didn't sell the whole bike. They sold you a race kit. We're gonna get into that shortly and they supplied wheels. This is the rear wheel for the Honda CR750 and it's a twin leading shoe. You can see how it's got, well, inside, you can take my word, there's a cam for the brake shoes and there's another cam for the brake shoes. So really, this is overkill in a way because when you brake hard, you get a lot of weight transfer onto the front wheel and the back end gets light. Why you need a twin leading shoe, I do not know, but it looks cool. This is a little bit hokey. That's obviously been made up, I believe. So anyway, a, a twin leading shoe on the back. It's cool, but I think it's a little unnecessary. There's those other two holes. And, and, and can you see how they're on the other side, they were up top, bottom. So on, on this side, it got staggered at a 90. There's your two holes for the sheet metal screws. Okay, let's go up and look at the front brake. This looks basically to me like a, a stock Honda 750 brake. On the, on the CB750, they had one of these brakes on one side and then the racers would put another one on. So this is a single piston and it's hinged on this plate here, this out, outcropping plate. There is no piston on the back. 
So it's a single piston. So you have, have, have two of these, not a very strong brake, but everybody sort of had weak brakes back then. A big heavy disc, didn't even drill any holes in it. So this is early, early disc brake because Honda came out with a disc brake for a production bike, 1969. So this bike, I guess you call it a 1970 race or something like that. So this is really kind of elementary in the terms of modern braking. I want to talk about Frankie Yuhan. Frankie Yuhan, him and his father owned Honda Center. That was a Honda dealer in, in Vancouver here. And he is the owner of this bike. He bought this bike off of Ron Krause. Ron Krause is a name that's going to be popping up more in this story because he is really a central figure of, of the story. So they had this Honda Center for, I don't know, 50 years or so. And Frankie used to race. He used to race up at Westwood. I used to watch him race Yamahas and pull out of the van at 250, 350, 750. And there'd be Jim Dunn and there'd be Stevie Baker and the three of them would go around. Stevie Baker would usually win, but Frankie was up there. He was not slow. And uh, <clears throat> he went down to Daytona in 1969 and that's where he met Ron Krause and they developed a friendship and uh, a working relationship as well. Because Ron was the importer of, of Dunlop racing tires, so he was a very handy guy to know if you were a racer. So he was Frankie's sponsor for that as well. In May of 1975, uh, Frankie went down to, to Portland Raceway in Oregon. He's setting a new lap record on that bike. I look at the width of the bike and I can only assume that it's a TZ750 or are they 700s? I don't know. So anyway, he definitely was fast at times and uh, he's a good guy. So he bought, the, he bought this bike off, off of Ron in 2002 and it was stored in their showroom at Honda Center since 2002. And there's a photo of the bike sitting in there. At that time, it was race bike number 786. So I don't know the story behind that. So anyway, that's Frankie. So thank you, Frankie, for bringing the bike in here. Why the bike is in here. Have I mentioned this about the fender? I did. Anyway, we're making a mount for the fender. So Frankie has entrusted me with this job. And I didn't know exactly. I got some old photos that were really hard to see. So I have been given artistic license to make this fender. So we're going to look at the bike, talk about the fender mount now. Here's the fender, and the first thing that I want to do anyway, maybe other people have their own ways of doing it, I need to space it up off the tire because the tire needs some, it needs some clearance and the, tire, the fender has to be in line with how the tire is. So I took 3 8 wood, this is 3 8 height, and I put it in six spots on the tire. So that when, and I also marked where I want it because this, this fender hangs out the front a little bit more than it does in the back. So I put the, the fender on like that and you can see how it holds it pretty good and there's a little bit of space. What I, what, what I might have to do is to add eighth of an inch here, but I'll, we'll see later. This is, this is good for a, a start. Now, <clears throat> if you look at the, at the photo I have, can you see how the fender stays that come out from the mount that I'm going to build here? Those fender stays are not in line with each other. You see how this one angles up? I really don't like that. And I talked to Frankie about this and I said, you want to come around here and talk about all this and how it's going to be? Because I can't see, I can't see in behind the fork tube. I can't see really what's going on. It looks like there's a bend there, but I don't really know. So he said, no, I don't want to come around. You just do your thing. So I said, okay, you, are you giving me artistic license for this? He says, yes. So that's partly how this is evolving. So I wanted to find a straight line in between these here. So what I did was I took a, I've got a nickel silver rod and I can put it in here. And because of how it presses in there, it stays there. It's going to be the stay, but it stays there. So 
this is not perfect. There's the hole, it's raised up a little bit. But, but what I did notice was that, okay, this is basically in line, so I like that. So this one here, it can go straight from here out to the end. I was working on this last few days, trying to figure out how to do this. So I made up these pieces. These pieces are gonna bolt on over here. So this is more or less the, the shape of the piece that goes under the fender. This is what is, is supporting the fender in the middle. It's the stays that are gonna support the fender at the end. So this is basically the shape. After I bend it, I don't know if these holes are gonna be in the right spot. So I'm gonna leave this longer. And then when this fits nicely, that's when I'm gonna mark the holes and that's when the holes will get drilled. This bolts on here. Let me see, there's a, there's a left and a right. And so then it's gonna get mitered. This is half an inch, it's gonna get mitered. It's gonna get a tig tack and then it's gonna get nickel silvered around and then it'll all get, get painted black. I've got six millimeter Allen screws. So that goes like that. And then that gets sandwiched in between there. So that's gonna be strong. And then up at the ends, I got these, uh, a stainless steel button head socket Allen. That's a mouthful for one little bolt. And that goes like that. And I'm gonna put a little, thinking about this last night lying in bed, I'm gonna put a piece of rubber on the inside there so it doesn't, it doesn't scratch all the paint and, and, and chafe a bit. So I have put quite a bit of thought into this. So can you see here how this, I'm gonna put this, this stay from here to here and this hole was only drilled halfway through. So what I did is I, I put a piece of metal behind because I didn't want the drill going through and marking up the rim. So I drilled through a quarter inch hole and it takes the six mil. So that's, so it's gonna get mounted there. Here, I'll show you quickly. And then we're gonna go over because I've, I've, I've gotta make one more. I've made three of these. So that's, that's how the stay gets mounted. And there's the front. So we're mounting stays off of those two pieces. I know it's not how Honda would do it, but that's okay. I have that artistic license. So we're gonna go to the lathe. We're gonna drill this out and counterbore it. Actually making stuff again in my shop. Flipping sides and counter boring. So it's drilled, chamfered, counterboard, deburred. That didn't take too long, did it? We're gonna use the bandsaw. We're, actually, we're gonna show the parts list of the CR750 kit. Up on the screen is a photo of the Dick Mann replica kit. He won the Daytona 200 race in 1970, and so that's probably why, why the kit got named after him. So it sold for $4,000 US money, 
And it's a little unclear in how many they sold, but I'm saying they sold a few hundred. You have to remember that back then, $4,000 was a lot of money. For a comparison, I have a friend, Eve. Eve did the helping with the starting on the Cub and Harry High Pipes. Back then, he was working as an RCMP officer, and his salary for the year of 1972 was $6,900. And he told me that, because he was into cars a bit back then, a 1972 Corvette convertible also sold that year, 72, for $6,900. So to pay $4,000 for the kit, that was a serious chunk of money back then. In the kit, I'm just looking through it briefly, you got wheels, gas tank, seat, front fender, Rear shocks, looks like a set of conies. Parts for the forks, like internal parts, you didn't get everything. You didn't get the crankcases, but you did get engine parts and exhaust system. Now that's a four and a four. I want you to notice that because as this story goes on and we talk about the race history, it changed from four and a four into four and a one. That was a big moment in the history of inline four-cylinder race bikes. And you got a set of, of Keyhine carbs. So that was your kit. And out of that, you built a race bike. So we're going to work on the, uh, the mount now. What I did is I, I made up, up some cardboard templates. And it's going to get mounted on the outside here. Here, we'll take out these guys. And so there is... That's basically what it looks like. Now it goes down there like that. And then I, I traced it to the fender. And then under the fender, I wrapped this around. And so now I had, I could, I could join these now. So that's how I made <clears throat> up the template here. So this is a, a little bit rough because I don't know exactly. And <clears throat> as I bend this, here's my piece of metal. This is 50-52, easier to bend. 60-61 is, it's eighth inch. 60-61 is a lot harder to bend unless you anneal it. So it's just the fender mount. So 50-52. So, when I bend this, I don't know if the holes are going to line up and I'm going to, if I'm going to have, have the right amount of clearance or too little. So I'm not going to drill the holes. I'm going to leave it so that basically I have the space to put the holes up or down a little bit. And I also want to put holes in there. <clears throat> but if I put the holes in first, which is going to be easier, it makes it harder to bend because it's going to bend a lot easier here than to bend here. So <clears throat> we're going to bend it first. We're going to make some holes. There's going to be three holes. Save some weight, make it look cooler. And then once it's on there, that's when we, we drill these holes get it all set up so it's nice and snug mounting in there and that's when we work on the on the stays and I've got I've got two stays made can you see how there's a right and a left and so I haven't so 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 these are for the front and then for the rear I've got shorter tubing because it's two different lengths and I'm going to show you how I squash this on the hydraulic press. This also needs a little bit of a radius this way because this is not flat. This is flat. So we need to put a little radius on that. And I think, I've, I, think I know how to do that. So we're going to do that as well. So this is what we're working on here. I know that... I could do it like that, and then I would save this extra metal here, but I'm going to do it in the middle. I'm going to waste a bit because I have this as leverage now. When I need to make a bend here, I have extra leverage. This shape will all get fine-tuned later. So I'm also going to make this a little bit longer here because I can make it shorter later because I don't know 
<clears throat> how the bend is going to affect the length and things like that. So just a little bit longer. I need to take the fender now and I need to scribe an arc so that I know what I'm looking for here in terms of arc rather than having to keep grabbing the fender. So let's go make an arc. Sean Studio, Daniel Sean, one of my students teaching frame building right now. So what I'm doing here is to, I'm, I'm slowly getting what I think is a good bend. So I'm using a felt pen and I'm tracing across. Doesn't have to be perfect, but it's got to be close. I got my template and that's a pretty good fit inside there. Can you see that? Not bad. It hangs up a little bit on the fold over, but that's okay. And then I went, I went snooping in my box of aluminum, my shelf. This is four inch round. And look at that. It's a little bit undersized. So you know how when you, when you bend metal, it always springs back a little bit. This is a good starting. This is good to start with. Okay. How hard is it to bend? Oh, not too bad. So I bench it from one, two, three, one, two, three, okay. Got the same bend. Not bad, eh? That's a good fit. Look at that, first, first time. Wow. That makes me feel okay. Okay, there's my stop. So what I'm trying to do is to get this, that has to be parallel. So it has to come in more, and then it's got to go straighter. So this is the tricky bit, because this is a little bit of, of finesse now.
I've kind of got the space in here, I think. So this is first try. First try to see how it fits. And... Okay, so what's happening here is that this... This guy here is in the way. So that's one of the reasons why we need a hole there. So it needs it needs a hole here, and I did plan to put a hole in there anyway, but there's an actual reason why the hole goes there is because this, see how it's not flat with this? This 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 sticks out larger. That's the fork booty. So we need a hole there. So we're gonna work I'm gonna work on that. You get the basic idea of how this is getting bent. Bent and built. See that? That's not very nice. I have to have to make that straighter because this one's pretty straight. I know once it's on there, you don't really see it so much, but that's too much. This is CAD design. And that's how I did these ones. So I draw a center line. My center line. Do you notice how? Well, you don't notice right now, but I bent it so it goes both ways because I need this needs to match the angle of the fender because this has to be bent like that. So there's a left and a right. So that goes like that. See the center line on the cardboard? I'm actually going to lower it down just to give a little bit more room. There we go, like that. And then I draw in my line. And then over on the arbor press, this gets eyeballed. So there's my line. Now for the other one, I bend it back the other way. Mark my center line. See how I'm using a finger? That's how I do that. Okay, let's go to the press. I just took a, a block of wood, what is it? Three quarters by inch and a quarter or whatever. And you see how I rounded one corner on the belt sander? That's where it goes up against that shoulder there. Cause I want a bit of a radius there. On the first one I did as an experiment, I just had an edge and it was really a, a crease. I know it goes behind, you don't see it, but that could be a stress rise that you never know. So there we have it. We have a left and a right. That's a nice way of flattening. So I just have to mark the hole, drill the hole, go to the belt sander, make a radius. You know how to do that. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the history of CR750-009. The Honda CB750 was unveiled in 1969 in January, and that was in Las Vegas. There was a Honda dealers meeting, and I think you could say that that meeting was a success. The, the dealers were really impressed with the Honda. In 1970, the Honda factory entered a bike into the, into the Daytona 200, and the rider was, was Dick Mann, and he, he won the race. There was a little bit of controversy, but we won't get into that, and now the CB750 was on the market, and they had a big race win because the Daytona 200 was arguably the biggest and most prestigious race in each U.S.'s calendar year. So now we get to the story part, and there's basically three characters, and one is Ron Kraus. He's the owner of uh, Kraus Honda in Pennsylvania, oldest dealer in that part of the world, oldest Honda dealer, and uh, that 
his relationship with Honda started in 1959, so it went way back. Another character integral in this story is Pops Yoshim Yoshimura, a Japanese man, <clears throat> incredibly uh, talented, and his son Fujio. And as soon as the Honda 750 came out, he got his hands on a, a KO model. That was a really early model. It did not have the sand cast motor. It had the die cast motor. And they started building race parts. He had a reputation already for making bikes fast. The third character in this story was a young rookie racer named Gary Fisher. He came from a motorcycling racing family. His Honda owned a dealership, and his father was also a road racer. So those are the three characters. Ron Krause, Pops Yoshimura, and a young rookie named Gary Fisher. So as soon as the CB750 came out in, in Japan, Pops Yoshimura got his hands on one and started polishing pieces inside, working with high lift camshafts, pistons, that kind of thing, and having some success, making a little bit of a name for himself in that world. Towards the end of 1970, after, after Dick Mann had won the Daytona 200, uh, Ron Krause, he realized that Honda only wanted to enter that one race, and having won it, they didn't have really any ideas or um, ambitions to come back and race in later Daytona 200s. So he knew that that was a bit of a hole in the, in the race field. So he decided that he wanted, or Krause Honda was going to enter riders in those races. So he approached Yoshimura through contacts and asked him for his help in developing those Honda motors and Yoshimura knew that the U.S. market was substantial, so he said yes. The stock Honda had horsepower of 67. When Yoshimura worked on it over the stages, it got up to 97, so he added 30 rear wheel horsepower. That's kind of impressive, I would say. Now, Ron Krause was also the uh, distributor of Dunlop race tires, so <clears throat> he became Frankie's sponsor, and it was also really good for the Krause racing team to get probably a really good deal on Dunlop race tires. At this time, 69, 70, Yoshimura was also working on the four into one exhaust system. He had an idea for how this exhaust used to be, and he found out that in his native land of, of Japan, other engineers working around Honda and on bikes, they really had no interest in, in the 4 into one exhaust system. It was, it was something which, the, which they didn't understand, and so he was basically on his own. So now we're at, at, at 1971, another Daytona 200, and, and Krauss, he knew Gary Fisher, so that's how Gary got his ride. Fisher was not a, a Honda factory racer or, or anything like that. He was, he was young. He was, he was a rookie. <clears throat> and at the, at the qualifying for the uh, at Daytona 200, you got a pretty good idea of who had a fast bike because on the banking, <clears throat> you could watch them go around the banking and see who's fastest. And in 1971, the fastest bike was definitely the Kraus Yoshimura. It, it was faster than any other bike there. So that was a really good thing for the race team. The race started and it wasn't long until, until, until Gary Fisher took over the lead. And shortly after that, the weak point of the bike, which was known to be the cam chain on lap 10, it expired and let go, and Gary Fisher was out of the race. And, and that bike was using the four into four exhaust system. Now we go ahead a, a little bit that year, and, uh, and Yoshimura had been working on the four into one exhaust system. There was a race in on Ontario, 
This is not, well, it was in California. It was close to LA. It was the Ontario Motor Speedway. And they had a big race, sort of, it, it, it was designed to cap off the race season. It was the, uh, a Daytona 200 in the spring, and then they did run all the races, and then the last race of the season was the Ontario. It was a 250, but it was actually two 125-mile heat races. And so this was where Yoshimura unveiled the the four to one exhaust for inline fours and it made it caused it caused quite a sensation at the race people had not seen this before really but i think re what really got to them was the sound they loved the sound of that four to one down low it was like a roar and then when it got up top it was a finely tuned shriek and so anyway, that's what really stayed in people's minds. I looked at, at, at the results for the Ontario 250 mile, and even though Gary Fisher was there, and that was the first time that a, a bike had been debuted with the 4 into one by Yoshimura. So on this bike here in behind me, that is probably a 4 into one made by Yoshimura. I don't see why they would have switch the pipe. A problem with the four into fours is they took up a lot of, of ground clearance. So the four into one kind of solved that problem because the pipes and the collector were all under the oil pan or the, or the crankcase. So they could lean the bike farther over into the corners. So there's a photo, Mitch is gonna show you a photo of, of Gary Fisher at that race, the Ontario 250, but he does, he does not show up in the race results, so I have no idea what happened. So now we go to 1972. We're at, at Daytona 200. Pops has been in Japan. He shows up for the race, and he, he cannot believe that almost every race bike with an inline four motor has a four into one exhaust system. Lots of little speed shops had been making their own versions of the four into one, but the four into one was everywhere. Leading up to the race, this bike, Gary Fisher's bike, it had a problem with the oil tank and it had a leak. So the tank got taken off, the aluminum tank, it got welded, even though sitting on the floor was a brand new oil tank. So Fisher really wanted that new oil tank installed for the race, but something about race bike owners wanting to save money and then to still have a spare for later on. So the oil tank, the brand new oil tank did not get installed. The fixed oil tank with the welding, it got installed and Fisher wasn't happy, but it's race time. So, so the race seemed to be going okay. And at about midpoint into the race, Gary Fisher, he took the lead on, on lap uh, at 27, guess what happens? The oil tank splits and Gary's out of the race. He should have crashed, but somehow he did not. And apparently he was quite upset. Well, actually he was pissed about this because he, he was quoted in an interview later that if he'd had that new oil tank, he's sure that he would have won that race. So, but that's racing and things happen. Now, as a footnote to this whole story, in Japan is a Honda museum, and they've got a lot of neat bikes, race bikes, and there's a section on road racing in the museum, and there is a bike, this is what I am told, unsubstantiated, but I have to assume that it's true. There is a bike that looks a lot like this bike, and it has Gary Fisher's name on it, but apparently, that is not Gary Fisher's bike. It's a replica. It's a substitute. This is Gary Fisher's bike. This is the real deal. So I leave you with that. Thank you for listening to the race story. And we'll continue on mounting the front fender. A little bit of time has passed. I've worked on the fender mount. I'm happy with the results. Different angles. I kept a track of my time. 
got all my all my minutes down there. So why don't you guess? In your head now, you guess how many hours it took me. Okay, you got that number? I spent 19 hours on this, so it took it took quite a while. Be interesting to see what number you came up with. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna mount this on the bike now. I have to take off these two struts here because it feeds up from the back like that. So I'll take these off, and uh, I'm sure Mitch will speed this all up. I got copper washers under here. It's very hard to find small washers. Washers with a small hole and a large OD. Installation is complete. Thank you for watching. Mitch and I like coffee. If you shoot us a few coffees, that'd be much appreciated. Take care, we'll see you next time.